Hello and welcome to Interrupting New England, a Critical Dialogues Forum. My name is Professor Jeremy Campbell from the Anthropology and Sociology Department. And um, Critical Dialogues is a research forum for members of the RWU community, faculty, staff, uh, students, um, that encourages academic dialogue designed to deconstruct and reinterpret power structures. Uh, so today is the third uh, of this year's forums uh, sponsored by Critical Dialogues. And we'd like to thank the President's Council on Inclusive Excellence for funding this event. And of course, uh, thank all of you for coming out. We have about 50, 55 people in here, so uh, we're going to have a really great uh, dialogue. Uh, and here's some really great presentations as well. We'd also like to announce or remind you, if you've already seen the advertisement, uh, we'd like to announce this event, which is happening on Friday at 6 p.m. Dr. Anthony Affinier from the Political Science Department of Providence College will be here uh, presenting on themes very similar to what we're, we will be exploring today. Um, if the title of this talk, as you can see, is Latino Emergence in New England, Cultural Crisis, Political Opportunity, or both. Uh, Dr. Finney is a professor of political science at PC and a visiting fellow at Brown University Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. His work focuses on Latino politics and critical race theory in the United States. And he's recently been honored with the prestigious Goodenow Award from the American Political Science Association. So uh, we're very happy to have him here. And his talk will take place right here in this very same room, GHH01, at 6 p.m. on Friday. Now, how this works is the panelists who you see in front of you, you have five distinguished panelists, are going to each have about seven to ten minutes to present their work, uh, present their research, present their reflections on today's theme. <laughs> And then we'll have about an hour or so for discussion. So uh, hold your questions until the end, but do somehow write them down or note them so that when the debate kind of opens, which I'll be moderating with a, with a traveling mic, um, you can remember what stimulating comment or question you wanted to put before our panel. Um, also, at the very end of the forum, we'll, we'll be collecting um, evaluations for, of this event so that you can reflect on what was good, what you learned, what, what we could have done better. So uh, we appreciate uh, your input in advance. Okay, to get things started, I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about the theme. Uh, for those of you who have been to Critical Dialogues events before, you know that we choose a theme and people reflect on that theme. Today's theme is uh, Interrupting New England. In the past, we had looked at um, Deconstructing the Western Gaze, which looked at um, issues of politics and representation in the Global South. Uh, we've also looked at Gender and Globalization, which looked at gender politics from a variety of vantage points. Uh, and today, we're looking at New England. But what is this interrupting bit? Well, as you can see in the handout, I won't read it to you, but you can take a look at it. What we're trying to do here is take a sort of uh, not conventional look at the region, uh, starting with maybe even right here at Roger Williams, right? So just for the next couple minutes, I want to do a little bit of interrupting for you, which will set the stage, give you some food for thought to set up the discussion that's going to be coming, right? So Roger Williams, right? A, a New England idol, right? Idol meaning quaint, uh, peaceful, bucolic, right? Picture perfect, right? Many of you who are students, maybe even some of you who are professors and administrators, chose to come here and become part of the Roger Williams family because it is a beautiful place, right? It's wonderful, it's peaceful, it's safe, right? And that's all very well and good, right? Uh, Bristol, of course, as well, right, uh, has a particular image that sells, if you will, an image that travels, an image that uh, attracts uh, certain kinds of attention. Of course, the world famous or at least nationally famous, 4th of July celebration, the oldest continuously running 4th of July parade in existence, right, from the 1790s, the early 1790s. Uh, it's such a big part of local culture and local identity that, of course, the main uh, strip uh, of High Street and, um, is that Hope as well, uh, have the red, white, and blue instead of yellow. Um, and here I'm, I'm sort of, you know, being a little bit cheeky by saying that this is Norman Rockwell meets Yankee Doodle, right? I mean, it, it almost feels like you're walking into a painting of... Americana, right, as you as you sort of traverse through Bristol. And uh, again, this is an image that uh, sort of travels out there in the world. Um, we can think of other images of New England that travel out there in the world, right, of picket fences, small towns, town greens, town meetings, uh, Robert Frost, City on a Hill, these sorts of things, right, which speak New England and speak New England far from New England. But if we dig a little deeper here in Roger Williams' campus or here in Bristol, we start to see other narratives, other stories, other histories, other cultural dynamics, right? So the question that is maybe central to the presentations that 
we're giving today and hopefully the discussion that we'll have is what gets occluded, what gets left out, what gets blocked from these traveling images, right? From the Norman Rockwell or from the uh, New England Idol, right? And one of the first things that gets sort of, I'm gonna go through four quick examples. One of the first things chronologically that gets occluded is the story of Native Americans, right? And that's not unique to New England, right? But this particular spot is actually deeply rich and deeply awash in Native American history, uh, and yet it seems that uh, we don't do such a great job, and, and for that matter, uh, Native American contemporary stories as well, we don't do qu quite a great job of integrating that into our popular consciousness on a daily, on a daily basis. Um, the image on the left is of Metacom, or Metacomet, right? Who, who knew that Metacom Avenue was named after this indigenous leader? A smattering of people, right? Metacom Avenue uh, is named after King Philip, Right, King Philip's War, 17, uh, 1675 through 76. It's basically the last stand of the Wampanoags. The Poconokets were a lineage of the, of the Wampanoags. Last stand against uh, the forces of uh, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay Colony. Right, Benjamin Church, there's a street in, in uh, uh, Bristol named after Benjamin Church. There's a nice plaque that says, here lived the Indian killer, Benjamin Church. Um, and Metacom uh, sort of... Uh, you know, the, the story of Metacom and the, and the significance of Mount Hope, actually Montop, right, the, you'll, you'll recognize the hill on, on the upper right, that's Mount Hope, which is right over here in Mount Hope Bay. Uh, Montop is the Poconoket name, right, but um, the anglicization of it, the anglicizing of it, uh, may turn it into Ma uh, Mount Hope, right? So that's, that's a particular story that is uh, sort of washed over. One that is becoming more prominent because places like Roger Williams and places like Brown University are talking about it, but it's, it's definitely a deep scar and a lasting sort of um, aspect of New England history is the impact of the transatlantic slave trade, right? The Brown fortune, the James and Nicholas Brown fortune, which then provided the seed money for Brown University came from the trafficking of human bodies across the Atlantic Ocean, right? The DeWolf family, maybe some of you have taken your own families to the DeWolf Tavern for a lovely seaside dinner. Um, that tavern in which you're eating used to hold uh, human bodies as commodities, right? Um, it was a slave transshipment depot, right? So this is not on the wall, this is not on the plaque, but it is part of the history of this region uh, that perhaps doesn't show up. Uh, moving on into the 20th century, uh, the construction of the beautiful Mount Hope Bridge in the 1920s. Um, it was built by Italian, Irish, and Portuguese laborers, um, uh, all of whom were unionized, uh, but who were sort of compelled to work around the clock when uh, the, the bridge went over budget and when there were structural issues with the design, the cables were weak. and. Uh, the, the city and state wanted to inaugurate the bridge. They were running out of time, they were running out of money, so they compelled workers to uh, work extra long shifts, which in fact they did, and it opened on time uh, on October 24th, 1929, four days before the stock market crash. A week after the stock market crash, all of those laborers were out of a job, right? Um, this doesn't get told either in, this, in, in the story uh, that, we, that we read, if, even if you have read it, at the, at the foot of the Mount, Bri Mount Hope Bridge where there's, there are plaques uh, regarding the story. And finally, coming back home to this campus, um, the Cold War militarization of th this part of the world, and for, for that matter, the entire country, uh, Roger Williams used to hold Nike Ajax missiles. In fact, um, in, on North Campus, the place where uh, the Bristol Redevelopment Agency is, that used to be a silo and launch pad for Ajax missiles. Um, so that particular history, maybe some of you are aware, maybe you aren't, but again, uh, reverberations down through the years. So these four sort of easy um, things to kind of pick out of the landscape and say, wait, that's, that's not dominant, or wait, we, you know, we, we don't hear much about that. It's food for thought, right? And they set up the stage for three things that we like to do today. First, we'd like to interrogate how certain images, certain stories, certain ideas of New England gain traction, gain salience, become representative somehow of the region, often to the exclusion of others, right? Second, we'd like to investigate New England regionalism from non-dominant perspectives, right? Um, we're a very diverse region. We always have been a very diverse region, despite the conventional wisdom to the opposite, right? 
So to that end as well, we'd like to explore, third, explore the meaning of diversity in a region that is, and in fact, history shows us, has always been in the midst of sociocultural changes. Indeed, since the 17th century, uh, there have been many peoples, many languages, many cultural practices um, melding together in this region, um, some mixing, some not, right? So uh, that provides sort of the stage in which we can bravely dive in and interrogate and question some of the sort of received wisdom of what it means to be in New England, right? So with that, um, I will turn it over to um, Jorge Alorza, who will be speaking, he's from the uh, school, school of Law, Professor of Law, the School of Law. He will be speaking on exclusion and crisis, inclusion and hope. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for the invitation. I appreciate um, you reaching out to me, and it's also very exciting to see so many, so many folks in the audience. As Jeremy, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, there are a number of communities and a number of places within Rhode Island uh, whose uh, stories are excluded, and Central Falls is a place that has a long history um, and certainly a story of its own. So today I'd like to speak about the city of Central Falls and talk to you about its history, its structures, and its people. And I'll try to move rather quickly to uh, abide by, by the time limits and, and, and follow the rules. Okay. So Central Falls is a small city. It's actually one square mile um, just north of the city of Providence. It's part of the Blackstone Valley, and the Blackstone Valley is commonly uh, referred to as the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. During the 19th, uh, particularly during the late 19th century, the city was anchored by a number of textile mills and uh, these textile, textile mills attracted a number of immigrants from Ireland, from Scotland, and also from Quebec. After the Second World War, many of these groups found um, uh, upward mobility, and they moved out of, out of Central Falls. They also left the textile mills and moved to suburban cities and towns. And it, as a response, and in order to attract workers, Many of these textile mills um, um, sought out new workers from uh, Colombia. And the reason why uh, many of these workers came from Colombia, and in particular they came from a, a, a town called Medellin, Colombia, was that uh, Medellin also has a heavy concentration of textile mills. So the textile mills in Central Falls were able to recruit workers that already possessed many, uh, many of the required basic skills. And one of the early immigrants to come from to come from Colombia, to come from Medellin, was a man by the name of Pedro Cano. Um, he came to Central Falls from Colombia, and he quickly became a point person for this um, uh, Medellin to Central Falls connection. In a documentary that uh, was completed just before um, Mr. Cano passed away, uh, Mr. Cano spoke about his, his work recruiting a number of Colombians to follow him to Central Falls to work specifically in the mills. And at this, Mr. Cano was extremely successful. You know, he soon became, as I mentioned, this point person. Mr. Cano spoke about receiving a number of phone calls in the middle of the night, often from complete strangers. And when they arrived from Colombia, often to either the bus station or the airport in Boston, uh, Mr. Cano would pick them up from the airport he would bring them home, they would sleep on his couch, and within a matter of days, they would be working in the textile mills here in Central Falls. And it's stories like this occurring over and again that help to establish the Colombian culture in that city. However, over time, and in particular during the 1980s, many of the jobs in the, in the textile mills um, either downsized, they relocated, or sometimes slowly disappeared. Although the jobs no longer existed, much of the uh, housing stock uh, did exist, uh, d did remain, and this attracted a number of other immigrants uh, from Latin America, notably Mexicans, Guatemalans, and Dominicans. So today, the population in Central Fall consists of uh, peoples from throughout Latin America, uh, but the Colombian heritage is, heritage is still deeply rooted, and it functions as its cultural base. So as I mentioned, the economy in, in Central Falls certainly struggled, and it has continued to this day. Uh, today, Central Falls ha has the lowest median income of any community within the state. It also has the lowest home ownership rate of any community within the state. So with this weak and unstable tax base, Central Falls has, of course, struggled to balance its budget. 
And in fact, the city of Central Falls had their entire school system taken over by the state back in 1992. And that's because of their chronically low performance and also because of the city's inability to provide stable funding. So as you might imagine, public school students experienced their share of struggles. A recent report found that Central Falls High School had a dropout rate of 51% last year. And the teen pregnancy, pregnancy rate in Central Falls was three times the state average. And just two years ago, the city made national headlines when the 70 plus high school, high school teachers um, in its one public high school were fired. This caused a nasty dispute between the unions and the administration with the students caught in the middle. The community in Central Falls has long been detached and disaffected from the political process. Although Latinos comprise roughly 50% of the population of the city, they've never managed to hold more than one of the city council seats at a time. And this is with elections that are often won with little more than several hundred votes total being cast. Without an engaged citizenry, there's been little oversight and little accountability of elected officials. And in fact, the mayor, whom by the way, it's widely known, does not even live in Central Falls, um, which is a problem in and of itself, uh, this mayor is also under um, investigation for uh, corruption. And as if all of this were not enough, the city is bankrupt, and I mean literally bankrupt. In 2010, Central Falls became one of the first municipalities in the United States to file for Chapter 9 bankruptcy. And this is where they still find themselves as their finances are managed uh, by a state-appointed receiver. So by virtually any measure, the prognosis for Central Falls is bleak. However, over the last few years, there are signs of hope that have begun to emerge, and there are significant signs of hope at that. So I mentioned that Central Falls had its public schools taken over in 1992. So in 2005, a woman by the name of Ana Gano Morales became the chairwoman of the Central Falls School, uh, School Board of Trustees. Ana, whom I am uh, proud to call a good friend, happens to be the daughter of Mr. Pedro Cano, who was one of the early uh, Colombian immigrants to Central Falls. Ana is well known in the community. She's well respected throughout Central Falls. And under her leadership, the school board, uh, the, the, the schools have undergone significant, and some folks would say extraordinary change. The school hired a, 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 a superintendent, Dr. Francis Gallo, who has proven to be fearless, who is reform-minded, and who has consistently stressed that uh, the interests of the students will always come first. Anna and Dr. Gallo have led, have led the district through the difficult and testy uh, decision to fire all of the, all of the high, school, uh, high school teachers. And while the dispute between the unions and the district is still being played out in many in various and subtle ways, it's clear that the transformation model that they adopted is beginning to pay dividends. In particular, the district hired two individuals, uh, Victor Capellan and Patricia Martinez, um, to help implement this transformation of the schools. So first and foremost, it's important to, it's important to stress that both Victor and Patricia have long histories of community involvement in Central Falls, and this is one them the communities respect. By having the support of the community, they've been able to remove ineffective teachers, they've reached out to disaffected students, they've added coaching and training time for teachers, and they've, and they've uh, almost entirely changed the culture within the, within the schools. In the past week, an independent research group found that Central Falls had, in, Central Falls had increased their four-year graduation rate from 50% to 70% over the past two years. Also, the district has entered a very interesting partnership with a charter school that um, is quite significant. It's, 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 a, it's a partnership that is unique um, and was recently fe featured by NBC News um, as they sent their special correspondent, Chelsea Clinton, who spent a week in Central Falls and touted um, its achievements. 
but these changes have not resulted solely as a result of the individuals involved. They've also occurred because of structural changes that have been instituted in Central Falls. In particular, since the state took over the city's schools, the mayor, the city council, and also the, and, and, and the local teachers union have lost a great deal of the influence over the management of the schools. So in effect, the school board, the superintendent, the, the transformation agents, and the school principals have had far broader discretion to implement their plans. And aside from the changes, so aside from the changes in the schools, there have also been important political changes. In 2010, when the mayor and the city council realized that they would run out of money and would not be able to, to pay their bills, they voted to seek protection through the bankruptcy court. Four out of five councilmen, as well as the mayor, supported the move. One council member did not go along. However, once the city went into receivership, all of the city's operations were taken over by the state-appointed receiver. And this receiver demoted the mayor and the city council to advisory status. So since then, each of the council members and the mayor who originally supported going into bankruptcy now oppose it. And ironically, the one councilman who originally opposed bankruptcy um, has been the one who has been cooperating and working closely with the receiver. And in fact, the receiver today uh, frequently turns to this councilman for advice on various matters. This councilman's name, his name is James Diosa, and again, I'm proud uh, to call him a friend, a good friend at that. He's in his mid-twenties, he's Colombian-American, and he has lived in Central Falls his entire life. Just as is the case with Ana, with Victor, and with Patricia, James has deep roots within the community, and he's well-respected throughout. In fact, his family is one of the families that Mr. Pedro Cano long ago helped settle, in, helped settle into Central Falls. James has championed various, various causes, and most importantly, he has organized community residents to leaflet, to march, and to participate in the process. In sum, James has emerged as a true and organic leader in Central Falls. So just as we saw in the schools, James's influence does not rely exclusive, exclusively on his individual efforts. Instead, it's facilitated by the structural changes that have already occurred. When the receiver reduced the mayor and the councilman to advisory status, he chose, wisely in my opinion, to retain James to provide advice and to manage some of the city's affairs. Again, the state intervention has removed the barrier from political participation and has allowed for a more community-centered approach, and the decision-making now better reflects the wishes of the broader Central Falls community. So I'll conclude by making uh, just a few observations. So Central, Central Falls still faces a number of very severe challenges, and, and its future is uncertain. However, there are individuals in the school system and in City Hall that understand and can relate to the community at a very deep level. And just as importantly, the residents have begun to feel that the schools and City Hall have individuals whom they trust and whom they could turn to. After a full generation of economic, educational, and social decline, for the first time in a long time, there's, there, there, there's hope in Central Falls. The experience of Central Falls should function as a lesson to all communities of the consequences of excluding residents of any background from actively participating in civic affairs. By the same token, the signs of progress in the city's fledgling resurgence should drive home the important lesson of tapping into a broad base of democratic participation, including immigrants, the indigent, and the disaffected, because it, because it is their involvement that can determine or undermine the success of any venture. Thank you, Jorge. Next, we'll be hearing from Professor Nancy Nestor, and the title of her talk is From the Podium to the Pavement, Practicing Civic Rhetoric and Engagement Down the Road.
opportunity to talk to you about um, the type of engaged scholarship that I practice in the community. Um, up on the slide, um, I have some of the key texts that I'll be alluding to, particularly the uh, last two, which are important to some of the um, projects that I'll describe. Um, this first quote is from the public work of um, rhetoric. To study and practice rhetoric out there is to embody the role of the rhetor by tapping into new streams of disciplinary life through embodied practice that is guided by a critical reflexivity and community affiliation. Um, in the field of rhetoric and composition, there have been many, many strong calls to action, such as the one you see here. Um, Ellen Cushman, in an award-winning 1996 article, called upon rhetoric rhetoricians to be agents of change, uh, to put their talents to the service of civic problems in venues where they could develop their theories rather than apply them. <clears throat> Cushman, Coogan, and Ackerman, as many others, <clears throat> excuse me, have been greatly influenced by the work of Paulo Freire, whose, uh, particularly his, the praxis he describes in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and praxis refers to the process of transforming theory into practice, or the process of enacting theory. And Freire stresses that educators should become involved in, his words, educational projects that can be carried out with those who struggle rather than making the oppressed, and I quote, objects of our humanitarianism. In a newly published report, The Crucible Moment, it was prepared, which was prepared under the auspices of the Association of Colleges and Universities at the invitation of the Department of Education, um, a task force found a critical need for educational institutions to involve their students in civic action that is impelled by their civic knowledge and inquiry. So I just use that as a backdrop to describe the engaged pedagogy that I'm involved in at the, at the present time. For the past several years, with various groups of Roger Williams University students, I've been partnered with the James L. Maher Center, an agency that offers meaningful educational, cultural, vocational, and social programs to adults with developmental disabilities. And this relationship began uh, during our university's second annual Community Connections event, and that's a day on which the university demonstrates to incoming students how they can enact one of our core values, which is up on the screen, commitment to community through service and sustainability. I was a site leader for a group slated to take on some tasks at the Maha Center. And I was puzzled because my group was not assigned a bus. Instead, we were directed to walk down the road to a building that is beside our new, what is now our new human resource um, complex. Now, the Maha Center was established in 1953 by 13 families who were certain that they could offer an alternative to the institutional model of care that was standard at the time, and especially practiced at the infamous, if you're from Rhode Island, you know of this school, Ladd School in, in Exeter. And um, this school was in existence for 86 years and was shuttered in 1994. There were documented abuses there, and at best their care could be called custodial. Um, so we, on that day, after painting the walls of the Bristol workshop, we invited the people uh, supported, or clients as they're sometimes called, to join us in our reflection period as we brainstormed ways to nurture our new relationship. And one young man um, explained that he and other clients spend a lot of time looking up the hill at the construction, the GHH building was going up, at students on the athletic, on the fields, uh, you know, practicing different athletics, and um, just other activities, you guys walking around, and he wanted a tour of the campus. 
And uh, this was not a request we expected. We expected to be invited to the Senate to, to do more, you know, activities. Eventually, we, and I mean different groups of students, arranged that tour. And over the years, we've accomplished other goals uh, with the center. So let's fast forward to spring 2012. As I plan to teach uh, Writing for Social Change for the second time, I contacted the center to determine which of the ag agency's goals could be accomplished uh, by collaborating on research and writing projects. Um, the challenge the class was presented was to help the center reprise an arts program that in 2011 culminated in a wonderful Newport gallery show, but currently had no funding due to very severe budget cuts. In fact, in the last three years, the state has cut $37.6 million from funding to the developmentally disabled. The center is alone, and I quote from their newsletter, has lost a million dollars and staff have not received an increase from the state since 2003. Um, so we took on the project, but we did so in the context of larger ensuing dialogues on human rights, civic engagement, as well as the teaching and practice of um, rhetoric, all of which I press into the three overarching course themes that you see on the slide. So currently, my students are using their rhetorical talents to mount this year's art show and to secure the financial and material support to sustain the program for the long term. And interestingly, the strategies that we developed to achieve the uh, long-term goal were almost simpler discursive steps to use than the ones we needed to achieve the um, short-term goal, which is the to, to launch the showcase. Um, but we knew that to be per persuasive, uh, we needed to produce this, sh this showcase. We needed to create some art. Um, and practitioners of community-based pedagogy know that we cannot always um, select the lessons that we'll teach, that they're often chosen for us. So in addition to um, writing, we paint. And more specifically, we teach the clients to paint wooden tiles and large canvases that when brought together will be reminiscent of the work of modern artist Pierre Mondrian. And we do so because our dialogue with the staff and the people supported has deepened our appreciation of their goals and objectives. And the experience has taught, up, taught us that the agendas and the assumptions that we carry into uh, the agency, we should be sensitized to those. Though the people we work with constitute a group that is among, and I quote from Martha Nussbaum, the most painfully stigmatized group, the last thing they need is pity. Scholar Ann Jurek uh, warns that though emotions such as compassion and pity, and I quote, may seem authentically personal, they can be expressions of power, falsely oversimplified understandings of social and cultural relationships. So such emotions can really cloud our vision to the way that we are complicit in the diminishment of the opportunities of people with disabilities, contributors, in fact, to their powerlessness, and an action such as an uncritical rejection of a state tax hike can limit their agency. So we understood that the people supported at the uh, Maha Center have absolutely no use for our pity. They wanted to paint, they wanted to communicate, their um, stories, to express their joys and concerns, some articulate their dreams, to marry, to go to college. And now my students construct their argument and their final proposals. You know, when they do this, they'll speak from inside an experience. They'll know firsthand of the material conditions under which such programs are offered. When they maintain that the program has merit, they'll do so as witnesses describing their involvement. These examples will be combined with the research they collect to corroborate their claims. <coughs> and we hope to host the showcase at the end of April, but I know that even if all else fails, what the blogs say and the colors reveal is that something special took place, unpredictable and messy, yes, yet something that could not have been realized were our agency 
circumscribed by classroom walls and are theorizing never transmuted into community action down the road. And I'll leave you with this quote, we should do human development and social justice and not simply learn about them. Thank you very much, Nancy. Next, next we will hear from Leandra Fox. The title of her presentation is, What Ain't White is Black? Being to any degree, degree black is the same as being to any degree pregnant. Laura Lovett. <laughs> While on a walking tour of Bristol, Rhode Island, local historian and former professor Kevin Jordan met, made mention of a 19th century woman by the name of Maria Hazard. He said that she was listed as black on one census and Native American on the very next. Jordan did not elaborate, but for some reason, excuse me, of all the histories he spoke about that day, the idea of Maria Hazard was the one thing that remained in my mind. Why the idea of a potentially mixed race woman was of such interest to me, I have no clue. Maybe it was a personal kind of intrigue, something that I, the researcher, could relate to, the confusion of what to label oneself. Who was Maria Hazard? Who were her parents? But more importantly, why was her race so seemingly fluid? How can a woman go from black to Native American within a matter of years? Did her mixed blood allow her to be allow her race to be fluid and change it whenever she saw fit? And does this fluid nature of this mixed blood race still exist today? All of these questions floated around in my mind. I had to make some sense of it before delving into my research. Here's what I came up with. Maria Hazard lived in a place, the United States, where the one drop rule applied to most, if not all, mixed bloods. The one drop rule is an unwritten rule in the United States, which states that if a person were just a quarter black, they were considered to be black. The term mixed blood provides a counter argument to the one drop rule. It is a person whose parents are of two or more races. But what about when that mixed blood contained African and Native American blood? Unlike Spanish American countries, the United States did and does not have names or classifications for each mixture of race. For example, a half indigenous and half Iberian person in Spanish America is called a mestizo. There were classifications of all mixtures of races in Spanish America. In the United States, the system of classification does not exist. And therefore, the race of a mixed blood is fluid and can change given different circumstances. My initial goal was to find two censuses in which this change of race occurred. But what did race mean to Maria? Did she feel that her race did not determine the color of her skin and was therefore insignificant? So insignificant was the social construct of race that it did not matter to Maria. I wanted to know why her race changed. I had no idea at the time how ambitious this goal actually was because in all of my archival research, I never actually found out. Racism and slavery didn't exist in the North. That's what we always hear. However, Rhode Island especially, has a very unique history with the slave trade. Although R Rhode Islanders were not slave owners, they played an integral role in the movement of goods and slaves across the Middle Passage. This is referred to as the triangular slave trade. In Rhode Island, rum was produced and taken to the west coast of Africa. This rum was exchanged for African captives who would soon become slaves. Across the Middle Passage, the ships went, carrying the new slaves to the Caribbean. It was here that a reasonable amount of the slaves were sold in exchange for molasses. The molasses and the remaining slaves were taken to America. Some of the slaves were sold in the south, and the others went north with the molasses. The freshly arrived molasses would be used to make rum to take, the west, to, take to the west coast of Africa, and the cycle would begin again. Within this very small African community in New England, it is not hard to believe that there were Native American and African relations. Why wouldn't there be? They were two oppressed people, and it is very likely that would, they would find some kind of common ground. In the South, Native Americans owned slaves. It is believed that Native Americans became slave owners so that they may whiten their society and gain the respect of those at the top of the racial hierarchy. This is not to say that all Native Americans in the South were slave owners. Some even harbored slaves, uh, harbored, excuse me, and cared for runaways. This African-Native American relationship was completely different in the North. 
Up here, Africans were valued more for their skills rather than their color, and they found refuge in Native American communities. With this kind of relationship, it is very unlikely that there would be no interracial marriages. How did the offspring of these marriages identify themselves? Their race was absolutely fluid. There were no restrictions. But how do we, as society, accept this fluidity? We place labels on people all the time, whether consciously or unconsciously. This idea of a fluid race is something that we cannot wrap our heads around. The entire idea of a fixed race is a social construct anyway. It is something ingrained in us since the time of the one drop rule. You can only be one or the other, or so we say. I had a mind opening experience that changed my way of thinking on the fluidity of race, especially amongst Native Americans and Africans. I attended a powwow some time ago that featured members of a local New England Native American tribe. I overheard one of the young performers shouted another, agitated, saying, you know you don't mess with a black girl. Whoa, right? Thought she was Native American. <laughs> we can use this case study to ask the question of the fluidity of race. What is this story? What about this story makes it so shocking? Is it the fact that she challenged the norm and did not self-identify as Native American? Or is this identity something which was learned as a tool of acceptance? Or is it simply the fact that what ain't white is black, just like Maria Hazard? In the 60s and 70s, Native Americans and Afro-Indians both struggled to establish a respected identity. Many young Native Americans of the time embraced black culture and lifestyle. Not only did they embrace the culture, but they identified themselves as black as well. This was not seen in a, as a problem in society, simply because they were, quote, colored. Now back to Maria. I was disappointed to say the least. After my research in the Bristol Archives, Town Hall, Ancestry.com, you name it, I came to the conclusion that Maria had no say in what was recorded as her race. I fear that the scribe may have been the main cause of this confusion. A few of them may have been more open-minded and willing to accept the fact that mixed bloods existed. And others, the one-drop rule may have applied. Or maybe Maria didn't look like a typical black woman, and the scribes recorded what they saw fit. But why was there all of this trouble? Maybe it is because race isn't as cut and dry as we think it is. We need categorization. Why? I have no idea. I find categorization to be useless and only a tool for discrimination. This fluid idea of race still exists today as was shown in the powwow case study. It is amazing that it can challenge an age-old concept. Mixed bloods can choose. They can shape their identity without the help of society. They have one fixed race or a race that changes in different situations. They're challenging the norm and it's about time. Thank you. Thank you, Leandra. Our next speaker is Shane Bumstead and his presentation is named Social Services for Sale, a study of social service nonprofits in Newport County. So I just want to say all the research I'm talking about in this presentation is based on my uh, senior thesis uh, research in the sociology and anthropology department. Um, when I began my research, I wanted to know how finances affect what nonprofits do. I wanted to understand more about how they are financed and about their ability to gain funding. While addressing this question, I also wanted to better understand the relationships between nonprofits and the community, in this case, Newport, Rhode Island. I've been conducting research on this topic since last September, but the subject has been in my head since my sophomore year at Roger Williams. I started volunteering at a nonprofit organization in Providence that was designed to help men and women coming out of prison in a variety of ways. In my experience there, I tried extremely hard to help people that were dealing with a variety of different obstacles, including homelessness, substance abuse problems, and finding employment. I was very ambitious when I first went to work there, and I believed that somehow I could make a difference in the lives of the people I was working with. I'm sure that I did, but by the time I left the organization, I was at the very least disheartened about the prospects that many of the people I was working with still faced. I felt that no matter how hard I personally tried to help them, there were simply no tangible resources available for them. I felt that I was doing a lot of talking with them, attempting to solve problem solve all kinds of problems that there were actually few solutions for. This is when I began to wonder about how nonprofits function and how finances play into this. 
My research took place in Newport County. The reason I chose to study Newport was simply that I lived there, but as I began to, to study the demographics of the town, I found that it was a very dynamic and divided place, especially in regards to wealth and poverty. When one thinks of Newport, one might imagine the mansions or the beautiful ocean scenery that exists there, but there is also a side of Newport that one might not see. One of the women who dealt with homelessness and issues in Newport, who I interviewed, uh, said it best. We have certain people who send us donations. They realize that people have been homeless, but there are others who quote, this is Newport, and that's tough. According to a census.gov website, the population in Newport County is 82,888, and 7.3% of that population live below the poverty line. One can easily begin to see that Newport is not only composed of mansions and millionaires, there seems to be a split in the county of Newport, which the same lady who I interviewed at the homeless nonprofit pointed out to me. When I asked her about the homelessness problem, she noted, it's a big thing here. You don't really know it because it's Newport, and then there's Newport, and there's two different sections, but we received over 4,000 calls last year to help people. This became an interesting part of my research when I began to look at the individual nonprofits. The split seemed to be quite similar. My research consisted of three main elements interviews, content analysis, and visual analysis. I was able to meet with CEOs, vice presidents, and program coordinators from six different social service nonprofits, all in Newport County. As you can see on the overhead photos, the size of each nonprofit was quite different. Out of the six, two were much smaller operations in terms of finances, number of employees, and physical size, while the other four were quite large. The small white building was one of the smaller organizations which consisted of one small reception area in the front and an office behind that with a total of four employees. Both of the smaller organizations had lofty aspirations and the one that was still in business dealt with a great number of people each year. The main difference was that these organizations received much less funding than the larger ones. After finding this out, my next question was simple. How does it happen? How do some organizations have a great amount of resources with which to provide services while others do not? Many factors contribute to the resources that organizations receive, but it seemed that the most important were state contracts and grants. One of the people I interviewed from one of the larger multi-million dollar nonprofits said it best. We can provide better quality care for children than state care and elder services and family-based services, and we can get paid by the state for doing that, and then we can make money. The key point that was introduced to me during this interview was the influence of state funding on the nonprofits. I immediately wondered how much of the money came from the state so I asked the interviewees at all of the organizations. Most of the larger organizations came up with a response similar to this one from the first interview I conducted. Quote, a much larger percentage of state, a much larger percentage. In an interview at a different location, I asked how does the state influence what the organization does, and the, and the response was, what they choose to spend their money on and at what rates they provide that money, that becomes incentives for us to look at different aspects of business that we would do. So when they have more money to spend at a certain area, for example, that's going to create interest and possible incentive to see if that meets with our specific mission. The key aspect of this entire process is that state funding has a great deal to do with the amount of resources that an organization receives. In order to get the state contracts, the organizations must meet the needs that the state sets forth. The process of attaining funds in this way began in the 70s as neoliberalism began to set in. Instead of the state directly handling social service needs of the people, they instead began to pay outside organizations to do the work. At this point, social service distributors began to closely resemble capitalist corporate-based entities, which functioned through free market competition. Many of the agencies I interviewed adapted to this process and have also thrived in it, while others have not. The important thing that I've taken away from this is that the needs that are addressed in the county of Newport generally come from what the state dictates are social needs. The process seems a bit backward to me, as it seems that the needs would be addressed on a ground-up basis. After learning about the multiple processes that contribute to the funding of the institutions, I began to think of the split that was occurring in social service nonprofits in Newport County. How does the funding process contribute to the financial divide among the institutions? The answer to this question seems like a similar answer to many other questions. Some groups have the means to achieve their ends, while others do not. In order to acquire more resources, one must have a certain amount of resources in the first place. This became very obvious in the smaller organization that helped with homelessness in Newport County. In the interview, I asked about the relationship with state funding, and the woman working there responded, they'll just send you a list, and they'll say, here are some things you might want to apply for that might assist you in what you have. But usually, they don't give us very much. 
They tell us to try and do our own <laughs> fundraising for the simple fact that the money is getting tighter and tighter. But you know, those things work like that for everywhere. You can't, it's tough to get money. Um, the reality of this is that there are a variety of organizations receiving a great deal of money from the state, but they have staff dedicated to doing this task exclusively. So what does this all mean for those citizens who live in Newport who are homeless or live in poverty? It means that social service distribution in Newport is a stratified process. There are a variety of needs that exist in the area, but those who gain the appropriate funding to address those needs are guided by what the state dictates our needs. Sim similar to the way that poverty in Newport is marginalized by mansions and wealth, so too have the social needs of those people who require them. This has occurred because of the process of processes involved with a state influence system which may or may not be meeting people's needs on a ground up basis. This process contributes to the marginalization of the social service needs that exist in Newport County. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shane. And our final presenter is Professor Jordan Smith, whose talk is entitled Spaces, Space and Places of New England Hip Hop, Undergrounds, Margins, Mainstreams, and Hoods. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Just gonna adjust this a bit. Okay, so uh, the parental advisory uh, explicit content sticker uh, is actually there, not just to signify that hip hop uh, <laughs> occasionally has uh, lyrics that may be offensive to some people, but that those will be quoted in the presentation today. It would be impossible to talk about the kind of music that I'm researching without using them, so if that is offensive to anyone, then I hope we can all sort of be adults and understand <laughs> why I'm doing this. Um, so that said, uh, space and places of New England hip hop, undergrounds, margins, mainstreams, and hoods. Now, um, I've always incorporated hip hop into my own teaching and my own uh, research and uh, for quite a while, for about a decade, have been uh, using some from uh, Boston rapper Mr. Lift. Some of you, in fact, in my English 100 class will uh, recognize that name for uh, one of the songs uh, Live from the Plantation that I'll be talking about a little bit later today. Um, but moving to New England uh, last year, um, I began to examine uh, what are the other uh, sort of presences of hip hop in this region and, and what do they mean uh, both within the Boston metropolis that kind of anchors um, New England cultural geography and also outside of its radius. So I'd like to start with a couple of basic definitions um, from French philosopher uh, Henri Lefebvre. Um, he defines space and place uh, in two different ways. Um, space, he says, is socially produced. Uh, it is a determination of physical space and material relations via those kind of cultural definitions. So it's a sort of agreed upon meaning that we put onto uh, space in general, uh, a kind of imagined geography. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But it generally functions through uh, the language of, of metaphor uh, and then descriptions of uh, various spaces. Um, in hip hop then, that uh, includes places like the city or the hood as opposed to suburbs or mainstream corporate center versus underground periphery. So there, there are spaces that do sort of exist in the real world, but they become uh, these sort of um, imaginary locations that are uh, laden with uh, extra value, extra meaning. The other definition uh, is that of place, and place is uh, a set of meanings and experiences associated with a particular locale. So what I mean by that, in hip hop you might talk about New York City, within New York City you might talk about the Boogie Down Bronx, um, you might talk about a specific music venues such as Roseland uh, within, within the New York space. So we're talking about basically place being kind of proper names, uh, places that you could point to on a map, and space is just a generalized conception of the types of locations uh, that come up in any given discourse. And the discourse I'm examining is that of hip hop lyrics specifically. Now, um, there's a, a kind of interesting evolution of, of place in hip hop. Uh, a lot of people will be familiar with this history, but it started in the late 1970s in New York City uh, with community groups like the Zulu Nation, Sugar Hill Gang, etc., uh, who originally began to kind of have block parties that were uh, established as a place for um, freedom and the experience of music and dance and other forms of culture outside of uh, racialized discrimination from police and also away from um, gang violence. So New York City was certainly the epicenter uh, of hip hop and, and um, no one disagrees with that. But by 1988 you had a kind of West Coast counterweight and the hip hop geography became a, a sort of a binary. You had NWA in 1988 who came out with 
uh, uh, an album uh, straight out of Compton and kind of in that sense put Compton on the map and um, what that meant was to increase a general kind of public uh, awareness of what these cities were of their general presence and also of their generally kind of problematic uh, nature. Oakland, California around the same time was popularized by uh, West Coast rapper um, Too Short uh, in a lot of songs that make a very, very explicit geographic reference. Hip hop often makes use of the trope of um, telephone area codes in order to claim certain spaces and, and then to, to dramatize them. Snoop Dogg and other people in, in Long Beach are, are famous for very similar things. Um, that binary became uh, triangulated in the 1990s as southern states um, sought to create even more diversity, um, including in Miami with groups like the Two Live Crew and Texas, Ghetto Boys, spelling their own, not mine, uh, and uh, uh, Georgia, specifically Atlanta, with groups like um, Outkast. This continued um, in the 90s with Boston, uh, where the group House of Pain, uh, which was an Irish-American group, decided that they had wanted to carve out a certain space within hip-hop for their own ethnicity. They were fans of the New York-based group Public Enemy, which, was, uh, which is also based on a, a certain idea of, um, of black of militant ideology. And they loved the music, but they, did, they felt excluded from it for, for uh, racial reasons, for ethnic reasons, and decided to see what they could do within the space of hip hop uh, by identifying with their local uh, Irish community. And that the songs that they produce, such as Jump Around, uh, Danny Boy, and things like that, they, with, that have a kind of grounding in hip hop sensibility, they often employ sampling from uh, African American kind of Motown hits, uh, but at the same time, uh, also very, very uh, almost nationalistic kind of Irish-American um, imagery and, and lyrics as well. So Boston was kind of put on the map, uh, and Boston represented New England in, in a lot of ways for a long time in hip-hop, and that's now um, starting to change a bit. So I'll, I'll talk about that, but first I want to talk about New England as space uh, in, this, in the socially produced sense. Uh, and I'd like to seek some definitions through social media. So a lot of these, um, you know, I think um, Professor Campbell did a good job of, of, of setting the, the tone for what New England is in stereotype, and so I'm going to kind of skip through these a little bit briefly. But they're meant to establish a basic understanding of uh, New England space that I believe that hip hop in certain uh, interesting ways interrupts. So I looked at the Urban Dictionary, and a lot of you will recognize this as a, as a website that is popular in, in, basically it's vernacular, it's in common use. Uh, you will notice a, a lot of sort of misspellings, grammatical mistakes, and things like that, because this is, uh, this is something that maybe some of you have even uh, posted on before, but it's basically uh, takes a, a set of popular signifiers and, and, and defines them. Um, so they talk about New England region, first of all, as, as being uh, a place of great schools, it's very upper crust, um, you know, it's sort of beautiful, scenic, you know, landscape uh, is mentioned quite a lot, sports fanatics, but there's, this is the sort of typical upper crust definition of New England as a region. That's counterbalanced on Urban Dictionary by the inhabitants of New England. Um, they define New Englander as straightforward, no bullshit, working class, often have distinct accents, don't feel the need to be all huggy and flaky like Californians when they meet people. Uh, we'll give you a hard time, but only if they like you, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Um, uh, they, there is another sort of species of New Englander known as the New England gangster. And uh, this, this could go in a lot of different directions. I can feel the suspense in the room. But uh, um, it's a resident of New England with that old money. Usually resides in a suburb of Boston but has a summer or winter house in one or more of the following. Right? Uh, graduate or attendee of New England prep school and currently works for a father or owns a company bought with family money. Example sentences include John F. Kennedy was a supreme <laughs> New England gangster and most, it also includes most Fortune 500 CEOs or VPs. So what we look at is the space of New England it's constructed in kind of um, urban dialect or common parlance in America as one that is um, that kind of seesaws back and forth between the, the ultra rich and this kind of down to earth um, working class no nonsense uh, person. Uh, the New England redneck is, is another one. Um, I, I'm going to kind of skip this. It's mostly just put in there for humor. I think you get the idea of New England as a kind of uh, space that is marked by this tension by, of class differences. So I, do, I think that class differences um, are part of New England imagination, but it's, it's usually only put in there as kind of a parody or a self-parody. And I think what this panel is doing partly is taking that a little more seriously and asking about what that dynamic means. I think that there's a sort of basic existential shock to just the fact of hip-hop in New England. And so a lot of people, when they heard that I was talking about um, hip-hop in New England, it was sort of, uh, I didn't know there was such a thing, right? Um, it, it's that, 
it's that sort of um, sense that New England is a space where the only kind of music would, would typically come from uh, either a kind of homogenized um, white groups or from a more traditionalized kind of folk or Irish background um, without, a lo without a lot of appreciation for the diversity of musics that, that are actually here. So I just mean that the term New, uh, New England hip hop is sufficient interruption for some, just kind of stating the basic fact of it. Uh, but I think that even in locally grounded social media communities, New England hip hop is, is seen as a novelty. New England is kind of subdivided into two groups, uh, or into multiple groups that um, see each other as kind of increasingly exotic. So at the website, New England Hip Hop, oh sorry, it should be hiphop.com, um, they're even surprised to find hip hop in Vermont, right? They, they say, when you think of Vermont, what comes to mind? The Green Mountains, snowboarding, maple syrup, and hip hop, right? Okay, maybe you don't think of hip hop, but we have a core group of Vermont artists here on NEHH with more soon to follow, uh, who are trying to show you hip hop is alive and well in the Green Mountain State. And so what you see is hip hop is this kind of um, body that expands and is, is activated and made alive through its presence in these rural um, communities. The local authors and artists do an interesting uh, uh, sort of production of themselves uh, through bio blurbs that they construct uh, for websites and then become a kind of virtual self, a sort of avatar um, in, in digital parlance. Uh, one of them, uh, his name is Bernalada Endo. Um, and again, these are just people that are out there. I'm not necessarily advocating these as you know the, the best artists to check out, but but they're interesting and they do sort of problematic things. So his his bio blurb says, "Coming from the small town of Oxford, Mass, 20-year-old rapper Bernalada Endo proves hip hop is found everywhere." So again, you sense that kind of shock of like, "Wow, you can find it behind a rock or a tree or you know um, in a in a suburb or a, a rural a white working class community or something like that." Another one, Alec Woog, known as the Woogster. Um, was born and raised in the central Vermont area. And that phrase, that born and raised, always echoes to me with the born and raised in Compton of NWA. But this is born and raised in the central Vermont area um, because there's nothing, there's no anchor point. It's just kind of an area, right? But he lived largely in Barrie, a small town known as, quote, the granite capital of the world. Um, you know, hardly the, the kind of homicide capital that typically marks large urban spaces um, in hip hop. Uh, and he also runs a cooperative record label called Rurally Urban Records. And I think this is very suggestive too because it shows his kind of sensibility to what is happening. They're essentially taking um, the typical urban lexicon, uh, the guns, the drugs, um, the malaise, the dissatisfaction, the violence, uh, and transposing that onto rural space and, and basically pointing out that these things happen here too. We deal drugs too. We shoot each other too. Um, and so in, in a certain sense, that doesn't sound like much of an intervention, at least not a, not a very positive one, right? And I can see gasps and uh, looks of shock and things in the audience, but, um, th but it's not always uh, what we might consider uh, in a university context as something socially progressive. And that's something that I'm gonna address um, later as well. I think the thematics in a certain sense are uh, are an interruption um, in these, and it helps to look at the lyrics. So if I have, do I have a couple, just two, two minutes? Perfect. Okay, so um, one of the, the themes, the racial unity through class awareness, um, is brought up significantly by white MCs who emphasize a kind of working class identity as a way to transcend um, racial barriers. Uh, one is a song by Square Root called I've Been Working," in which he says, they don't spend a buck to see me spit wicked, they um, think they hook me up with some free drink tickets. Right, so the idea of not getting paid, this, kind of, this is a typical underground trope, and says, but next day is construction site, I wake up every morning like, fuck my life. And the idea is that, um, you know, the construction site, right, that I am going to go in the morning to a blue collar job, I am not uh, rich off of this, and that kind of thing is developed in song after song um, in which uh, race is sort of eclipsed by uh, a working class commonality. Another one, Alex Wu, DIY or do it yourself, uh, he says, I'm going to be a self-made man, fuck a corporate label, music television force us to incorporate cable. Now my feelings are short and I'm losing my patience. They're enslaving all these artists like radio racists. And my favorite statement, fucking underground kid, only KRS can say what real hip hop is. I don't make hip hop because it exists in the Bronx. I make music. You can call it whatever you want. You know, the idea is, is he's kind of giving up the right um, to, to name the music, to claim it, and sort of pays homage to the Bronx as a sort of mecca of, of hip hop, and by doing that, thereby gains a kind of authenticity um, that he can use uh, in uh, other lyrics in this song, uh, where they're kind of defying um, corporate influence and, again, uh, creating a space for a kind of united class awareness. 
Um, I'm going to skip the, the multi-ethnic groups, but the Providence City Boys have a song called Providence, Rhode Island, in which their lyrics are, you know, all claiming the, the, the area code of, of Providence and um, don't seem to have a lot of geographical definition um, uh, clarity. I kind of think there's an irony in saying 401, yeah, I call my city Providence, smallest state in the country. Note the irony. Providence being the smallest state in the country, um, better bring your common sense. And so, you know, there's, there's a real kind of um, a defiance of educational norms in these two that are also uh, foregrounded. Some of the songs even say, like, I bring that ignorant stuff that you love. Um, and, and that sort of um, rebellion against an education system that's seen as oppressing um, people of all ethnicities uh, equally is also a point of, of unification. Um, black MCs emphasize the role in uh, in the kind of corporate hell, which I also find an ironic interruption. A lot of the uh, rappers like Mr. Liff in Live from the Plantation um, talk about what it's like to be um, working inside of that um, corporate environment. So I'll just go through these, these last couple of lines, um, talking about how his boss uh, loves that he's the modern day Sambo. Um, he says that we're all being murdered by a similar process, whether you work at the candy store or slave at the office. And the idea is that the corporation is transformed into the new um, plantation of New England. Um, he then talks about a cool bro, soon, soon to be the Boston Strangler, strangler appropriating local lore uh, of kind of uh, murder news stories in, in order to express the violence that uh, is about to erupt. <coughs> So, um, then just in conclusion, um, redefining New England space in hip hop logic of the underground mainstream and regionalized hood is part of this project of, uh, of New England hip hop, but it does have some limits. Oftentimes hip hop is just echoing kind of working class populist movements uh, or anti-corporate messages uh, you know, of the Boston against the Boston Financial District. Um, but what's really happening, and again, this is the sort of limit of the interruption is space, is merely being multiplied into new places. You just get the replication of the street block in the hood in all types of um, rural venues. So what my conclusion is then genre is the interruption, the fact of hip hop in New England, and also place is the interruption, where New England alters uh, typical hip hop uh, spatial imaginaries through a new kind of cultural geography. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you for all our panelists. Let's give them another round of applause. And as you know, let's see, <clears throat> now the fun part begins. Uh, now we can stretch, we can raise our hands, we can get called upon and um, start to raise questions, concerns, feedback, dialogue uh, to the panelists, the panelists to one another as well. Um, uh, one rule of thumb, nothing's off bounds, but please do introduce yourself before you give uh, your question. Okay? So who would, who would like to start it off? First question for our panelists. Yeah. All right. Um, I have a hip-hop question. What's your name? Uh, my name is Matt Berry. I'm a senior. Um, concerning New England hip hop, uh, because it's relevant to our school, actually, we have an artist called Chris Webby coming, who is from Connecticut, and a lot of his uh, sort of lyrical content is focused around like college life and marijuana smoking and listening to other rappers and sort of doing very suburban, very sort of white New England types of activities with a hip hop bent to it. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on how that clashes with the sort of emulation of other hip hops from around the country that some of the Providence rappers and Newport rappers or maybe these Vermont rappers, which I didn't even know existed, um, are doing. I think that that is, does this mic work? I think yeah. that I think that I think that speaks to you know the idea of space, and I think that the college campus has become a kind of space um, inside of hip hop as well for since at least the nineteen. 90s, there has, there's been a kind of college circuit of hip hop shows and rappers that know that they can kind of make a living off of going to college campuses around the nation. There, there are literally tour circuits that they kind of go campus to campus. 
Um, and they have their kind of shtick, and they make jokes about dorms, and they make jokes about smoking weed in the dorms, and all of those things that aren't supposed to happen. They're rebellious. They're, it, it kind of downsizes hip hop rebellion to the level of the college campus. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think that, that that discourse definitely comes up. I don't know the person that you're talking about, so again, I wouldn't claim to say what's true of him. But I think there are definitely um, alternatives within hip hop, alternative sort of spatial geographies, and the university is almost like a wormhole. <laughs> You know, over overlaid across the um, the larger dynamic of, of America. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, but I think it, that's also another sort of interesting thing to explore. And you're also right that a lot of the New England um, hip hop groups that you see are are just imitations. And that that's what I wanted to emphasize in that final point is just that the least interesting stuff to me, uh, but also the most powerful in in a in a kind of popularity sense, is the stuff that claims 401 that reps Providence that you know they're showing their tattoos of Prop City and um, and they're and they're filming like their videos show people getting beaten in the streets of Providence and brawls with local police and stuff like that that kind of iconography was you know developed by NWA and their Compton stuff and is now just being replicated I find it the least interesting but in some ways it, it's it's quite popular Hi, I'm Roberta Adams, and I have a question for Leandra. Um, I'll give you a chance to swallow. Um, well, I'm asking that question. I wondered, uh, while you were doing your research in the archives, if you uh, were able to place a Maria Hazard in any context of other family members or community in any way, um, and what kind of sense you got from the census records of the numbers of um, Native Americans, or if you saw any kind of patterns like that, did you have children with their parents, were there, you know, other things that indicated other identifiers for her? Um, I actually did, and it's really funny that you mention it because I didn't want to talk too long. I ended up with I don't know, like ten pages, so I had to cut, and those were some of the things that I cut out. But um, I did find Maria Hazard in the census. Uh, like I said, she was listed. <laughs> In her death record, she was listed as black. But on the federal census, it was black and then Native American. And I think the next one was mulatto. It just it just changed, like, constantly. Um, she was married to a man who was listed as a mulatto. Um, I can't remember her, her maiden name. I can't remember it for the life of me. But um, her parents were both black. I remember that. She had think three or so children and the pattern that I saw because I focused mainly on the death, death records because those were the, just like some of the only things that I could really find um, was that there were lots of blacks prior to Maria Hazard's death but as you kept going it it kind of whitened so it slowly became like the blacks kind of disappeared and it was more mulatto and there were absolutely no Native Americans I don't think I found one in my um, in my time in the death records. And I think that could be too, that they were being listed as black, or the other way, or the, you know, it could be anything. But yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jason Jacobs. I had a question for, um, for Jorge, because I found myself really sort of challenge to follow you at the at the end because your argument about um, sort of broader base community um, uh, approaches to rebuilding schools and sort of you know sort of creating some hope and opportunity in Central Falls passed through this stage of like demoting the mayor and the elected city council and sidelining unions and so um, I, I guess I wanted to ask a point of a point of clarification about that process because I, I was just worried that I wasn't actually following it the right way. Um, but then also to ask you to sort of help me think through somebody like me who's wired to think, you know, union good, <laughs> elections good, you know, to think about, to sort of default into into a certain kinds of assumptions about um, democracy. You know, it's, I, I caught the point about the mayor not actually being local. and. Um, and uh, it seemed that you were actually sort of making an argument that something more democratic is happening because the community has gained access, but um, those details of it are so kind of counterintuitive 
um, that I just really wanted to hear you say more um, about how that process is working as you see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and, 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 and it is difficult to flush out um, uh, the, the, the subtleties and the nuances of it um, uh, speeding, through, speeding through a presentation. But I think the point is that um, the, the takeover by the state is widely seen and criticized as being grossly undemocratic. Um, and so that usually means that the local community isn't being served. But I think that in order for democracy to work, you need this baseline of participation. So people have to keep watch, they have to, um, they, they, they have to be invested, and they have to hold um, their political leaders accountable. In fact, if there's any ultimate check on political power, it's um, at, the at, at, the ballot, at the ballot box. And so people have, to, uh, people have to keep guard. But I think that what happened in Central Falls was that there uh, didn't exist even this minimal baseline of uh, political investment and political and political environment, uh, political environment and involvement. So, um, so, so, so no one, no one was keeping guard, and um, both uh, the mayor and the and and, 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 and the city council um, took advantage. And over time, um, it's it's um, you know you 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 always run the risk of oversimplifying. Uh, but in a lot of ways, Central Falls can be seen as the good guys versus the bad guys. Um, and uh, the situation in Central Falls has had, um, had, had reached the extreme uh, that um, uh, the political leaders um, um, did, um, uh, were, well, I'll say, were commonly believed to be out of control. Um, and along with this, they also, they also controlled city contracts. Uh, city contracts with the uh, police union, with the fire department, with the teacher, uh, with, with the teachers union, um, and so that 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 runs into a whole list of other concerns about unfunded pension liabilities and uh, the um, and and the legitimacy of those those contracts. So I think that uh, uh, really the takeaway point is that there wasn't this minimal baseline of uh, democratic and political participation. Uh, to, 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 to perform that ultimate check on the political process. And uh, the results, the city being in bankruptcy, the melee between the unions and now, and, and now the city, uh, that's a direct consequence of no one keeping guard. Can I follow up on that too? The, I was just, so then the, do you feel like then the, the town was sort of made to learn a lesson in democracy that when you don't participate, here's what happens and therefore everyone kind of got involved? Or was it more that there are certain figures who came to be included and you're focusing on those certain figures? I mean, did, it, did people respond in a sort of popular sense and say, we need to get involved, and, you know, have, have recent elections, or, well, I guess there haven't been elections because they're still under a certain type of control, but you're saying that it's been, there's been a sort of genuine populist response and that's the, that's the positive takeaway? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I think that the saying that democracy gives people um, uh, democracy gives people the government they deserve is it is really true and that's what we see that's what we see in central falls um, it, I, I, I find it as I find it interesting and also ironic that uh, we tend to think that the uh, most community community oriented approaches are the ones that rest political decision making at the most local level um, but at the same time I think that um, if we're if we're if we're not careful and people are so detached from the political process uh, that that also leads to some of the grossest abuses because you have a very small community that is responsible for keeping watch and if this community um, is um, uh, is either detached or, or, or purposefully isolated uh, then, uh, then 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 we see what happens in Central Falls. So to answer your question, yes, I do think that that uh, people are being taught a lesson of what can happen if uh, folks don't actively participate on their own. And on the flip side, um, I think it's also, I, I think it's also um, a lesson to be extracted from here, uh, that if we do see a lack of political uh, participation in our own communities, um, um, e even, if we're, even if we're functioning as elected representatives, uh, that um, it behooves us, it behooves uh, us and, and, and the future of the city to reach out to newcomers within the city so that they are engaged at this, at this, at the very least, most basic level. Um, because if they're not, 
then the entire structure and all of the checks and this ultimate um, balance, these, these ultimate checks and balances are removed and the system can implode on itself. And I think, I, I think yes, um, we are being taught a lesson of what happens um, when you have an absolute uh, political uh, disengagement. I'm Professor Johnson from Communications. This one is for Leandra. I want to congratulate you. I thought that was a fascinating conversation that you started, and, and um, thank you for doing that kind of research and for taking interest um, in that level of research. There was something that uh, I wondered, though, while you were talking, whether further research may explain it. If it could be situated socioculturally or politically, is it I know you say you reject categorization, but it happens. Yes, you know, it's yes. a reality. Is it something that is imposed politically? Was it the categorization that you discovered imposed, or did they choose this? People who are now identifying themselves as Native Americans, mm -hmm. is it of benefit to be so identified? Or if they're identifying as black, is it a political benefit? Or what are, what are the advantages of identifying yourself either? Or could your research in, in future um, determine whether it's a political construct or it's a sociocultural historical uh, circumstance? Um, as a uh, not yet historian, I definitely <laughs> believe it's, it's historical. Um, I think uh, in some of my research I found that, uh, I think there was a chapter in this book called Confounding the Color Line, and it's a collection of a bunch of essays on um, African Native American relations. And in the book, there was this entire chapter on how it was more beneficial to be black, because Native Americans kind of lived on their own, but the fact that slaves Africans were laborers made them closer to civilization than Native Americans. So in that case, yes, being black may have been more beneficial, but not really. Um, <laughs> maybe on the social... Uh, see, I'm not... I don't know. That's what they say. They say that they were closer to civilization, but then Native Americans owned slaves. So it's kind of, you know, it doesn't make sense. But, yeah, I definitely think it's historical in that sense. I don't, don't really think it's political. I think Maria was labeled the way that she was, like I said, because of whoever was writing it down. Um, yeah, I'm from the Bahamas, so we just got our independence in 73. I know all about people messing up records. Um, I'm pretty sure that my name is not my name on my birth certificate, simply because they really didn't care. So I feel like it kind of goes back to that whole, oh my goodness, I have to write all these names down. Okay, oh hey, all right, you're Native American, oh okay, cool. Like, you know, I, I don't think that it was really something on purpose. Maybe it was, but yeah. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, if I may, sorry, exercising the moderator's <laughs> prerogative. Um, I don't remember, maybe you mentioned it, Leandro, what census dates were you looking at? Uh, at what point did Maria show up in the historical record? Oh boy. Um, Is it the 20th century or the 19th? The 19th century. The 19th, okay. I think she died in the 1890s. Okay. But so post-emancipation. I think it was the 70s uh -huh. federal census, so it was somewhere in the 1870s that this change right. occurred. Right, right. But prior to the Dawes Act, which would have changed the citizenship status of Native Americans, right? So <laughs> um, actually, uh, just coming off of my own Native American history, um, which Dr. Quezada Grant would be much uh, more disposed to talk about, um, there might have been a political motivation to have her denied citizenship by, by the role taker putting her down as a Native American because prior to 1888, Native Americans did not have American citizenship. Um, it was as, as a result of the Dallas Severalty Act that uh, Native Americans were given, not all of Native Americans, but Native Americans on scheduled roles of scheduled tribes, which is another wrinkle in the story, right? Um, Maria probably wasn't asked, and it probably wasn't written down what her tribe status was. Um, some Native Americans in this region uh, who are uh, contempt in contemporary struggles to try to gain tribal status recognition have been trying to do so because they weren't written down as 
you know, federally recognized tribes in the 1880s when this initial census of Native Americans was being conducted. So there's a lot of interesting wrinkles, and it might well have been the case that in the 1870s, whoever was writing it down saw her as not worthy of citizenship status and wrote down Native American for whatever reason, right? Um, if he had written down black, then citizenship status is, is accrued, right? So I'm interesting wrinkle. Yeah. I'm Reverend Cavalcanti. I have another question for Landro based on the same thing. Um, you were unclear in your speech as to whether the people doing the census made the designation or whether she claimed her own designation of what she was. And in that sense, couldn't the fluidity, the non-specificity of, say, of um, racial identification be termed a positive? Um, I don't around bush and pretend that I know but um, I imagine that you know I, d I don't really know what census taking was like back in the day and I don't really know what the attitude of the census taker would have been you know that's the beauty of history you don't really know but um, as from what I can see because of the changes I just I can't imagine why she herself would change her race and the fact that I found that um, that she was black, Native American, and then mulatto, just, you know, just that, I, I don't understand it. And to me, it's a mystery. So I'm not entirely sure if she said, oh, hey, I'm Native American, or I'm black. But I just imagine that it would just be, because of black and Native American status in society at that time, I don't think that they would have been asked. I'm just saying I, I appreciate that response. I think that's a very common. But I mean, the time you have the time that you're talking about here doesn't have that short time. Just my opinion. Hello, I'm Professor Prado in journalism. Um, uh, my question is really prompted by the points brought up by Professor. Nelson and Professor Lorsa, but I guess any, all of you uh, could speak to this. Um, I'm always very surprised, having come here from Florida, uh, that we are we have so little diversity on this campus. So since you were looking mostly at high school or middle school in uh, in the rest of the state, I was wondering if you'd speak a little bit as to whether you believe we have a responsibility as a private liberal arts college in New England to uh, try to ensure that there is uh, a diverse population on this campus and that we share our wealth with uh, minorities since we are in a position uh, of proximity, of geographical proximity to these underserved populations, or whether you think it is acceptable or uh, you, whether you have any prescriptions uh, as to how we behave as a very privileged community amidst all this need. <coughs> Who would like to feel that? I think she opened it up to anyone, um, but maybe Nancy or Jorge, you were mentioned in the question. Um, at our university, uh, several years ago, um, Alan Sean Feinstein gave us a very generous contribution to institute uh, service learning and civic engagement on campus. Um, and yes, I do think that we have um, a responsibility, a kind of social responsibility, to engage with um, our community and you know, to go out, to get into the community, and to explore you know, what are the various needs and how can we you know, actually use our talents to better um, this community. Uh, this type of work has been going on. Uh, I'm not sure that it's um, totally integrated into the curriculum. I think that the university wants to move in that direction. But yeah, I, I do think there is a type of social responsibility. Um, if you you know go back some years, and uh, Robert Putnam uh, wrote that article and then a book, uh, Bowling Alone, and he bemoaned the fact that people in general and students uh, weren't involved, weren't getting involved in association, weren't creating a kind of social capital that comes with, you know, bonding with other people and then bridging, moving into, um, in, you know, 
working with groups with whom you might um, initially feel you have little in common. So yes, and, and I certainly, uh, and, and in my field, we do feel it's, it's quite important to get out of the ivory towers and to you know, move into the communities and to see what the real needs are. So, um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in my work at the law school, I look uh, mostly at uh, housing policy. And uh, there was a report in 2005 um, that, um, that, that, that concerned me a great deal. It, um, it said that low-income low inc low neighborhoods are on the rise, high-income neighborhoods are on the rise, and middle-class neighborhoods are on the, the decline. And it concerned me because it speaks to the stratification of, of society. And uh, the and uh, as, as as professor mentioned, uh, the, la the the lack of interaction that goes on uh, within uh, uh, or rather between uh, between different communities. And so as as far as our, our responsibility as a university, you know I think that you know one um, you know one 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 argument for uh, greater inclusion, greater diversity, and um, affirmative action, um, if you will is that we get to share each other's cultures and these cultures then come back to our then come back to our separate communities we spread it amongst our friends we spread it amongst our families and it helps to create more of this one society one community that we're more that we're all a part of rather than these stratified rather than these stratified communities um, so i definitely think um, you know that it behooves us to promote promote inclusion um, aside from that also as a as a specific university um, uh, for example, um, Latinos in, in Rhode Island are projected to, compri to comprise roughly 30% of the population of the entire state uh, by the year 2050, 2050 or so. And so, not just a, as a matter of social responsibility, but there has to be this um, uh, convergence of interests that also in terms of um, um, uh, making, uh, uh, making, making our, bo our, our bottom line um, um, work. Um, uh, it also makes sense for us to reach out to a you know, very diverse um, student body. So um, I think uh, where we stand as a where we stand as a community, we're really we're truly in in, in, in a unique place where uh, we see it as part of our social responsibility and our social mission, but it also aligns very neatly with you know, the fact that you know, we have to balance our balance our books. Uh, so so I th so I think we have an opportunity. I certainly you know do do hope that. Um, you know, we fully uh, live up to that responsibility. Can I still comment on that? Sure. I think, I think that um, those are really great suggestions that you guys provided, and I'm also new around here, so I'm seeing this with sort of um, a, maybe a different perspective and maybe it's naive, but I think that, um, that, that strat the strategy also has to be based on attraction rather than promotion, and that, that a lot of times what we can do as members of the Roger Williams community, if we're looking to see a change on campus, we can make sure that like when we live our daily lives in the community, um, when we're on the street, as we might say in hip hop, you know, sort of spatial, uh, spatial metaphors, right? When we're out there, that we're talking with people about uh, about our involvement here, and that we're making friends with the kinds of people that we'd like to see on campus. And if that just means everybody, then be friends with everybody. And it's something that, that you know we do with you know who we choose to get phone numbers from, with who we choose to go out to coffee with, who we choose to eat lunch with. And that, that kind of cultural diplomacy for a university has to take place you know, at the level of the street, at the level of daily interactions. And that's how you get people to, um, you know, to feel comfortable here. And it's also something I think a lot, a lot of the people here, I'm sure, agree with it. It's creating a campus dynamic where um, people feel integrated. And it's not like, oh, when you go to the commons, there's this table of people, and they all look alike, and they all have the same sweaters, and they all have the same ponytail, and they all have the same, you know what I mean? Um, being able to, to reach across to people at the level of friendship is extremely important. <clears throat> Excuse me, extremely important, and I think a lot of us hesitate to do that um, just because you're, 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 we're raised in little incubators with you know little little chicks that hatch from similar colored eggs, and um, and understanding that you know it's not necessarily the birds of a feather. I mean, birds of a feather may flock together, but that doesn't have to be the case. You know, it, it, it might take a little extra effort, but doing that on the daily, I think, is, um, is a way to kind of make a naturally open place where people want to come and then feel comfortable. 
another uh, provocation to think about, and I'll just leave it out there, and maybe you can respond in future questions. But I wonder if anyone in the panel um, on this issue of inclusion, exclusion, and the social responsibility of an institution and the role it plays in the kind of broader social fabric, are there challenges specific to being a New England private university that are that are um, that, that are worthy of sort of contemplation, right? I mean, the the Robert Frost good fences make good neighbors. One goes away, one you know handles one's own flock, one tends one's own garden, and one uh, meets only in the public sphere to vote or to do those things that are deemed public, which are you know maybe differently configured. The private public sphere differently configured in the sort of history of. Um, you know, New England, Protestant New England coming out of John Winthrop, right, from the 17th century forward. And I don't know that I put too much stock in that sort of argument, but it's maybe worthy of thinking about the specificity of building community in a place like New England that is, uh, I'm also relatively new here, and I feel it is by far the most segregated place I've ever lived in the world, um, including the Middle East, oh, I'm sorry, not the Middle East, um, <laughs> uh, California, the South, uh, Middle Atlantic States, and Latin America. New England is, offenses really matter, right? Um, and I think that specific uh, cultural history uh, is worthy of contemplation, too. Um, my name is Ryan Harper. I'm a sophomore. Um, and I certainly agree with a lot of the points that have just been stated as it pertains to social responsibility. Um, that's something that's at the core of what I would like to do uh, with my major in the anthropology department. Um, and that was something that I came to personally out of circumstance, I ended up doing disaster relief after high school for a couple of years in New Orleans and got a lot of exposure to it there. Um, and uh, upon applying to college and attending Roger Williams, my path shifted for a time, but over the past few semesters, sort of becoming more acquainted with a lot of social issues and sort of reigniting my interest is something that I found my way back to and really what I intend to do, I'd like to do um, nonprofit based work. So I'm just curious, um, you as educators, some of the techniques you found, and, and Professor Smith, you touched on this a little bit just now, some of the techniques you found to sort of engage students on a classroom or even a personal basis to sort of ignite their own interest in these types of issues. That's for, that's for anyone. Uh, one of the things I do um, in my uh, senior seminar, for example, is to ask students to select a social problem um, that has some relevance to their life, you know, in which they have some stake to go out do some research on what is, uh, what are the current practices being used to address it. And then, um, well, first of all, they have to, to make sure that the um, social problem exists, and it's just not an assumption. They have, it has to be measurable, observable, and they need data. But later they look at how it's being addressed, and then they sort of think of ways that it, the problem could be um, you know, ameliorated and maybe resolved in even some just modest way in some corner of this campus, in, in one classroom, in one boardroom. Uh, Ian is, is, is in my class and, and working on such a project you know, in a kind of very methodical way. And in that particular class, I asked them to take a first step. Just, you know, putting the theory into practice is, is very important to me. And um, it's a, a pedagogy and a scholarship that is only recently being legit, legitimized and acknowledged. But it's very important work to actually think about what is it that you would actually you would do in terms of mitigation. You know, on Monday at 9 a.m., is there some small thing that you can actually do? So getting students out there and thinking about, you know, the wonderful ideas they have. But we have such great talent here. And we have, um, you know, they have strategies. The students are coming up with wonderful strategies. But, you know, to try to put it into practice. And, and by doing that, we um, they do serve as wonderful ambassadors of this university. Um, you know, even doing the type of research that Shane and um, you have done, I think it's just amazing. People are, um, you know, remark on this this type of research. But you're going out and you're actually doing something, even if it's a very people think they have to do um, things of great, uh, you know, scale. But you don't. It can be something very, very modest. So, you know, maybe think think globally, act locally, think bold. I think um, Ryan, that's a really interesting question. At the level of the the classroom. Um, one thing that I think is important to do is something that I came to realize uh, that I sometimes do accidentally in world literature classes. And um, in my uh, advanced literary theory class, 
we were joking, I was joking with a couple of students um, on the dangers of putting all the female authors in one week just because their theoretical writings happen to be kind of in dialogue. Um, and it gives the illusion that it's like, and now it's women's week in the theory class. And they joked that it was like, it's shark week on the Discovery Channel. And I think that when you, know, when you teach about cultural others, not kind of ghettoizing them through fetishized signifiers of, you know, let's do African Americans. You know what I mean? And now we're going to lump them all into that African American week. Just, you know, just teach. T you know, teach ideas. Teach, um, teach movements. Teach history as fluid. Teach it as passing in and out of text and, and containing various mobilities and multiple identities and things like that. And I think if you demonstrate that via um, syllabi that, that don't sort of, um, you know, segregate, then you tend to, I, I think, in a sort of organic way, foster that kind of thinking um, in, uh, in, in people's larger lives. Maybe. At least that's that's the goal for me. Um, this event is working because I have ideas that are all mushed together about all the things that, we, that we've been saying, and I'm having trouble picking them apart. But my ambition for what I'm about to say is to offer a reflection to Leandra, which then parlays into a comment about the way in which Nancy's and Shane's papers really um, got me thinking about something that I think is is a is a nuance to how we have to sort of think about the question that Paula asks. So that's what I want to do. The question that you're, you know, the, the I mean, the question of racial identity that you're sort of puzzling over in this case of, of Maria Hazard is, I mean, it's so interesting. And I think that one of the things that was so compelling about the way that you laid it out is that you really just sort of like let yourself be in that paper wandering along, trying to react to what is this? Why would she do that? What are the circumstances? And then as we follow through on, on the consequences of that, try to think about like, okay, you know, how is this person situated with respect to a census taker? You know, what is her historical moment? It, what, in what specific um, kinds of uh, circumstances does her um, identity emerge? But one of the things that I feel like always slows us down when we talk about identity, especially now, is this idea that the identity is somehow the most accurate reflection of who we are. And I teach this course right now on sexual identities. The three people to my right are in that class. They're going to roll their eyes when I say this because they're going to recognize that yeah, it's true. Yeah, it already happened. I, this is a thing with me. Like, I talk about this all the time now because we're living in this moment. I call, you know, I sort of, I call your generation ontological hardliners because it's all about, like, who I am, right? All these questions of who I am. Well, that's one element of identity. But another way to think about identity is as something that you can do something with. And I think in the, in the um, you know, a, a way to kind of open up some space to ask some more questions, in addition to all the great questions you're already asking about the case of Maria Hazard and everything she represents, <coughs> would you say, you know, it would not be to assume that every time that um, census taker came to her and asked, what race are you, that she would give an answer that was based on what she felt to be the most true thing about herself at the time, but rather that she had a sort of set of tasks to accomplish with respect to identity. There are sort of, and I think that's part of what Professor Johnson's question was getting at too, right, is there are benefits that accrue to certain kinds of identities at certain times, and the people who have those identities can come to be very canny about that, right? So one can identify as a very practical thing in order to show up for a certain benefit, in order to claim a certain right, in order to mark out territory, right? Um, you know, this is something that I really got thinking about last year when a student asked me. I mean, I, in my teaching, I'm very critical of the whole kind of idea of coming out, you know. And a student said, but it's weird, you're so out. Why would you be so out if you don't, if you're so critical of the concept? And my answer after thinking about it was like, well, you know, I want to tell people to, like, watch it. You know what I mean? I don't owe anybody, like, an explanation of who I am. But it's like, I got some stuff to do in my life, you know, and, like, an identity that I can mobilize is useful to me in that way, right? So, I'm sorry to go on so long. It seemed to me that your two papers were so interesting in the way that they got down on that level of um, this issue of things that certain people have to do in the world, right? Claims that one might like to make. And Nancy, you gave such a, I mean, it was such an interesting and wonderful and, and, and meaningful sort of um, discussion of the way that you're bringing students into a kind of alliance with a population. Um, uh, that has its own priorities, which your task is to learn, 
And then it was it was so clear in Shane's paper that Rhode Island nonprofits are not do not have the luxury of operating according to this model, right? Because you laid out in such an articulate way the way that nonprofits that need to find out who's going to give money and on what conditions will they give the money need to adopt the priorities of funders, and then what the population needs is a totally different question, right? I mean, I think that um, I. You know, would love to hear you guys just sort of talk to each other about the ways in which you can you can think about some of the intellectual models which are coming out of this tradition of rhetoric, which is completely unknown to me. You know, for for rethinking how you know the the nonprofit sector might be rethought, so that instead of like wealthy donors trying to figure out what the poor people need, it's it's a different way for you know people who have needs to make demands on people who have resources, right? We could build a whole national project out of that, for instance, right? But it also makes it really hard to think about this diversity problem that we have at this campus, right? How do you diversify a place that maybe doesn't want to be diverse, and what relationship can there be between those of us who want to ally ourselves with those who feel excluded, those who feel marginal, those who feel vulnerable in this context, um, when the structure itself is not is not set up, right? And so, um, anyway, big mush of stuff, but thanks for indulging me. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, I think that my project is definitely very laden with emotions, just because, um, like I said, I'm from the Bahamas. I don't, I've had a couple people ask me, like, what, like, what are you? Like, what, what race are you? And I really don't know. So I think that the fact that I found somebody who was just as confused, or people were just as confused about her, was just like, yes, if I can find out what she is, then maybe there's hope for me. So I feel like that's that's what motivated me to do it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that, that was just my comment. <laughs> Shane or Nancy, would you like to pick up on Jason's comments about uh, the sort of upside downness of social service provider? Shane? Well, um, I was just going to say the interesting thing about it in my research was what you picked up on what I was trying to present. It's just, there's such an interesting thing to think about. There, I think of needs as a something on ground level. You know, they're required, they're there. But it, it was an interesting thing, I guess, to think about the fact that, like even you, Professor Nestor, if you're trying to work with people, what I found when talking to the CEOs and nonprofits was that maybe, Perhaps what Professor Nestor is doing is not what's coming to the surface. Instead, what's happening is, you know, they are saying, well, this is how we are going to make money to live as a nonprofit. And then these are the programs that we're going to conduct instead of a situation where perhaps Professor Nestor is working on the ground level with people and recognizing what those people want or need and then bringing that to the surface and then the funds being uh, attained in that way. So it's. It's a weird thing to think about a service that is for people was being directed by state, I guess. Um, but it's a, a very tenuous situation that you put on put in when you, you do work out there. Uh, I have to trust that uh, there's been a lot of research done about the benefits of you know art programs and uh, you know working with students, and I've been assured of that. But you're right about the context. In just the past year, the the staff I've been working with, their salaries have been cut five percent across the board. So you know, one day we're working with someone who makes X, we go in the next day and they make Y. Um, you know, I caution my students too, and this has been um, suggested to me that you know we can't um, when we speak to a, a a public audience about what's going on at a center. You know, you really want to maintain, uh, continue to maintain that there's wonderful innovative things uh, going on, and there, there are, because no one, rich donors do not want to get behind a program that's, you know, a, an agency that's, um, you know, just offering the very basic care. So it's, uh, it, in terms of my students, rhetorically, they're understanding complex rhetorical situations, you know, the text they make, the audiences they're seeking out to support um, them, the genres that they're creating, and being very sensitive to these needs. I was talking to Shane before this um, um, session, though, and I, I was really struck that he was able to gain the trust of the CEOs. Um, and I was asking him how he did this, because I would think that they would be reluctant to admit that their needs are being defined 
at the top and yeah. not at the bottom. Well, the uh, this they were not upfront about that at all. Okay. All fact, right. I guess. Okay. <laughs> actually, right. the, it occurred through, right, like I said in the my statement, I think I did six hours worth of interviews, so it wound up being a little bit of a grind about money. I mean, even in a general sense, I think that people don't like to talk about money very much. So when I'm asking them about this, I kind of we talked about money a lot. So I think that through the course of all those interviews, I was mm -hmm. a little bit better able to understand how the process works. Mm -hmm. They were definitely open to talk to me about what their organization does, so it was easy to get uh, in the door. But then once I got there, we were talking about money, and that's a little bit of a different thing. <laughs> well, money is an important issue. You know, okay, you mentioned about the, the you know general public taking interest, and in, on um, the issue of the developmentally disabled, a uh, coalition has been recently formed, the Have a Hot Coalition, and they go up, you know, create a critical mass, go up and sit on the state house steps. Um, and complain and ask that money be restored. And I think, you know, sometimes it is a wake-up call that's needed to get people out there and, um, you know, bringing a voice to um, an issue. wanted to, uh, this is a question, Shane, for you. Um, and it's a really interesting presentation and something I don't know that much I'm about being new to the area, but I've, I've seen similar things work in other areas. But one of the things I wanted to hear more about was, um, you were talking about how the state sort of defines the agenda for local needs and and you know we tend to assume that that means that they don't really know what's going on and they're kind of they're distanced and sort of divorced from 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 the street as i keep talking about right they don't know what the word is they don't know what the needs are but in a place like rhode island where you know newport is a half an hour away and presumably a fair number of of politicians uh in state government also have you know ties or friends ties to or friends in that area um, you know, to what extent uh, are they truly sort of uh, distanced and and, uh, and ignorant in terms of what's going on? And, and what are their methods for, uh, if they are totally distanced, what are their methods for ascertaining what needs are? Are they, are they just sort of conjured or is, are there studies done or what is the... Well, for me, I'll be honest and talk about the research that I did do. Uh, I started at the beginning of the year with almost nothing but an idea, obviously. And at this point, I've come to begin to understand that the process exists, uh, uh, from what I understand, the RFP process, which is a request for proposal that the state sends out to whatever organizations feel like they want to try to get those contracts. So at this point, I don't know for sure what the uh, state's knowledge, I guess, of those people on the ground is or is not. Uh, I guess what I do know is that, according to the people I talk to, there are still uh, numerous homeless people in Newport and also the poverty level is still at seven to almost eight percent. So uh, I, I would at least question it, but I, I would say for sure I'm not certain what their uh, methods are for trying to figure out what needs exist. And uh, even if there were methods, I would still question them because I would surmise that the needs would exist in different ways depending on uh, geography. Hi, my name is Darwin. I'm a senior. Um, and my question is for Shane. Um, during my own research, I came across a concept called the squeaky wheel concept, which is basically, you know, who screams the loudest is the one who's going to get the most attention. So you talked about the different love, you know, different sizes of these NGOs and all that. So is there competition among these NGOs to get these contracts, um, you know, government funding or private funding? And like, you know, what is it all about? Because it is all for a good cause. So why is it? Why is there a certain pattern of distribution? Yeah, um, I'm gonna say there's absolutely competition among the organizations. It came up pretty frequently in my interviews, and what you have is, uh, well, I talked to six organizations, but they were happy to talk about the kind of culture of uh, nonprofits in general. I remember one interview. Uh, a man was talking to me about the culture of nonprofits in Providence where he noted that um, it's, it's, it's you know, extremely tough out there. It's basically kind of a fight for survival, especially when you consider that the funds that social service nonprofits are gaining in the first place are generally limited, uh, as you pointed to in your presentation. So uh, from what I understand in my research, there, there's a very high level of competition when you're trying to address the needs of the community uh, with an extremely limited amount of resources. It's very common for smaller nonprofits, especially, to be um, out of business, you know, with, with no problem. Uh, and
and then once again, we talk about the when I talk about the stratifying process, the ones that are larger and are um, you know have been going for a while, they're able to have the people in place to gain more funding by generally understanding the state process and then attaining the funding to perhaps grow or at least maintain. So I would say it's a, an extremely competitive kind of culture there. Just to pick up on that, Shane, um, I think um, it, 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 it's, it, yeah, you're right when you mentioned that there's a lot of competition, and it's, you know, a fight, and, it, and it's a fight for survival. Um, I think there are some <coughs> opportunities and also some challenges that that presents. So um, everyone would agree that in a lot of ways we're in crisis mode. And, um, and being in crisis mode, I think, um, uh, opens a lot of people up to big ideas. And um, as Shane mentioned, I, I've also seen an unwillingness to, to fund sort of run-of-the-mill, you know, sustaining existing projects. And people are more willing to fund something truly innovative. In fact, today, the front page of the Providence Journal, and uh, later this evening, uh, the Rhode Island Foundation is awarding its first uh, Rhode Island Innovator Awards, which is uh, $300,000 worth of funding uh, granted to two individuals who uh, came up uh, with their own project from scratch that, that they believe um, can, have a, can, have a great, can have a great impact. And that's great to see that kind of creativity being funded and given some, given some resources. But we can't forget you know, a lot of the you know, very important, you know, more basic services that, that Shane talks about. Um, so there's definitely that threat. But uh, hopefully that's counterbalanced by the opportunity that you know, people's um, uh, appetite for risk and openness to innovation um, um, uh, and, and how that may be changing. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that. Um, this, what I did was kind of my own take on it, but what you're saying right now, that was um, also a common kind of response that came up in the interviews, especially when the discussion, you know, came up about the competition. I mean, I would kind of grind them on the competition aspect of it. But a lot of the uh, vice presidents and CEOs, you know, just to counterbalance what I'm talking about, they did say that when you have an environment that's full of competition, uh, it does allow the most of the innovative and uh, and make the ideas to come forward, so that that would be another, um, perhaps, aspect of it or another way to think about it. Sure. Ryan, and I think this might have to be the last question, so make it a good one. <laughs> um, just to kind of build off that idea you were just talking about, then, um, you know, this sort of um, having a limited amount of resources, which are also limited in their own right in the competition that is presented. Um, I'm just kind of curious to know in your research, I mean, you said that the state sort of establishes what their take on the social needs are. I would imagine there's also a set of evaluation criteria that comes down with those um, with those issues. I'm just curious to know if you found anything more about what that what that criteria is or where it might come from, um, or, or even just how rigid that might be and how that in turn affects this competition between organizations. Are you talking about the regulations that the state would put on the money that they out or yeah, essentially, if the state establishes that X is the issue that they would like to see addressed and they're willing to dole out money to an organization focused to address that, how did they, in turn, evaluate the results from that organization to justify further funding? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how the uh, evaluation process happens. I do know that when uh, an organization accepts, or if the organization chooses to accept the contract, there's a negotiation period where the stipulations of that contract have been uh, worked out. So. What I also do know about, from what I've, uh, you know, understand in my interviews, is that when those contracts are given, uh, there are a wide amount of uh, regulations and stipulations attached to those contracts. So you're right when you say that the state does not give a, just um, a $5 million contract. The state gives a $5 million contract with very specific uh, rules and reg regulations about how or what is supposed to happen with the money. So once again, I guess that does kind of get to the point of state control instead of uh, round level control. But you might have a wonderful research question there um, to go into, you know, to ask uh, what kind of evaluation criteria do you use to assess the outcomes of some of these programs? I mean, you know, as you're asking, I'm thinking, wow, 
Um, actually, coincidentally, that is the topic of my research paper for my career, my critical okay. writing class. Um, sort of the evaluation process of nonprofits, sort of the business like criteria versus the social impact criteria, and how those can both work together. So. All right. Uh, well, I want to thank again our panelists. Thank you very much to the audience as well. It's been a very successful event. And um, audience members, before you leave, uh, feel free to come up and uh, talk to our panelists as well. But please do give Professor Prado your uh, evaluations of this event. And uh, remember, Friday as well, Dr. Finier is going to be presenting uh, his work on Latino emergence in New England.